that's what I did. But they were so busy as they went around here, and before worship service, you saw some of the pictures that were up there, and it was just a, my pleasure to go around and, and take pictures of all the women that were so busy, and all the men that we have to be so thankful of for the way they pull together and do the things that they do. Again, sharing their story, sharing their lives, sharing their testimony. And we're going to try to tie together all of that stuff this morning. We've got a whole bunch of things. I'm going to quit walking over this way. We've got a whole lot of things to, to kind of tie together. One of the things is it's Reformation Sunday. So how is he going to tie Reformation Sunday with the, the two scriptures that you heard read? One from Thessalonians and then the greatest commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. And emphasis on the word witness that we heard twice today that they're going to serve the church with their witness and you have promised to do the same thing. So, does this mean that I'm going to insist this morning that you take your Bible and head on out into the community and start beating people over the head with it? Get them into church, you need some churching up. Church <laughs> <laughs> up. This is the day that we celebrate this event right here. It happened, uh, this, uh, the, the nailing of the 95 pieces on the wall, that was uh, in 1517. But the uh, Reformation, if you go and look to see when the date of the Reformation actually began, it's a whole lot like if you were to ask when did the Civil Rights Movement begin. There was a whole lot of grumbling before March and so on, and before the riots that took place. There's a whole lot of injustice that took place before that. So to say exactly when did it begin, it's kind of hard to say. But we know that, I'm, and this morning's ser uh, sermon, if it is, it's going to be probably more like a, and then you're going to wonder whether you was in school or church. But when we start talking about church history, I get excited. Because church history is God's history. It's the history of God working in this world and doing amazing things through people just like you. And part of church history is being written every Sunday when we gather in this way. But on this particular date and time, Martin Luther decided that he didn't like some of the things that was going on in the church. And so that he, he decides to, and, and there was a particular practice that he didn't like, but that's not what this conversation is about. This conversation is about being uh, not railing against any one denomination or another because we know that what happened was as, as the, the Lutherans pushed, the Catholic Church pushed back, and they were at each other for a long time until the Peace Party burst in sometime about 30 years later. So we have this point in time where it's so contentious. And it wasn't just Martin Luther that had the, the, the idea to reform the church. We talked about... The, the, the Reformation as if it was just a Lutheran thing because Calvin was the name that was thrown in the mix. Uh, Henry VIII was the name that was thrown in the mix. He was in, in England. And when, when we see what happened shortly after the, the, the Reformation, we see that, that uh, we have visitors from across the lake that's coming over here and settle in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and settle in places like Plymouth, the Puritans that had come, separating from both the Catholic Church, and also from the church, they wanted, some of the early settlers wanted to separate from the Church of England. They wanted to start all over. They wanted to really reform things and say that we're going to have our own way of worshiping. Few things. Let me ask you this. Though. How many Bibles do you own? Does anybody have more than one? More than ten? More than twenty? That's okay. That's a lot of Bibles, isn't it? I'm sure we have a lot of different Bibles and we have a lot of different translations and we have a lot of different, you know, that, that, and we can go online if we want to because every morning I pull up my uh, Bible and I choose a different translation to read it all. I can read it all the, the Hebrew Bible and we can read anything we want to read and go back to the original text. But the, but the greatest invention that had, the, the invention had the greatest impact on religious life at the time of the revolution of the Reformation was, and if you've done my class, you know the answer to this. The printing press. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, can you imagine what it would be like to open up a Bible and it's in Greek? Or open up a Bible and it's in Hebrew? Or open up a Bible and it's in Latin? 
that doesn't do you much good. You need somebody to tell you what not only what it means, you need somebody to tell you what it says. But all of a sudden, we've got this printing press that was that was discovered in in, in, the, 14, in the 15th century and made by Gutenberg in around 1440. What do you think one of the first things he printed was? What do you think one of the first things he printed was? He printed the Bible a year before he printed indulgences for the for the Catholic Church. Yeah, I mean you got to make a living. <laughs> I mean, he spent a lot of money developing this printing press and it cost him a whole lot of stuff. But you see how this is all tied together into church history and God using people to do amazing things. But yes, he did print the Bible. The Gutenberg Bible was printed at somewhere around 1440-something. But a year before that, he did print the indulgence. And again, this is not any kind of, this is just history about the church, and the history is important because it's going to tie into where we are and where Paul found himself with the church in Thessalonica. We know that, that during this time that people could not interpret the Bible for themselves, and the Catholic Church was saying that we rely mostly on religion, on tradition, which is not, and that's one of our legs that we stand on. Wesley stands on four things, scripture first, but then tradition, experience, and reason are the other three legs of this chair. And the church stood mainly on tradition. And Luther and some of the others said, no, we want to stand on scripture alone. And so that, that once we were at a Bible that we could read for ourselves and interpret for ourselves, then reason came into play. And we even, and this is carried in even to today, when we read our devotionals, when we go to the Bible and we read it, and then we go someplace else, and we get an idea of how this should speak to us. We do it ourselves. We don't need somebody else. And that's why Luther's main claim was the priesthood of all believers. That you can be, you can work out your own salvation. If you have a Bible, you can do it. Now, you're going to need a church family to support you, but you can figure out what it says on your own. We're human beings created in the image of God, given a brain, and we don't check it at the door. And this is mainly what the point of the Reformation was. But you can see how quickly in time that it just carried through into the United when to into this country, that as the Puritans came over and started interpreting for themselves. And in all throughout Austria and Germany and all the places that it spread, it just changed everything. And the Anglican Church. I love it when people ask me, said, you know, I come from a Baptist background. Do you know how they came to be? It all goes back to what's going on right there. Then there's point in time. The Mennonites, same way. The Shakers, same way. All the religions that we have today, most of them can be either birthed through the, the Roman Church or through the, the churches of the Reformation. So, how does this fit into the lesson for today? We've got this idea that we can interpret Scripture on our own, but the best way for us to share the gospel, the good news, is the way Paul found it in Thessalonians, through the church. And if we go back and revisit that particular passage, what we'll find out is Paul says in, in verse 8 that we brought you, we shared with you the gospel, but we not only shared with you the gospel, we shared our very lives with you. It was as important for the people, for the church, as he's writing to them to encourage them in their time of persecution, that we shared everything we had with you. Paul told them about the, the way that he was in Philippi. And Acts 16th chapter tells us what happened when Paul and Silas was in Philippi and they healed the girl. And the town people got so mad at him and beat him. And then had him arrested and called the authorities. And then the authorities had beat him with a rod, threw him in jail. But he was saying that as bad as this persecution is, and I know the persecution you're going through, it's hard. But let me share with you some of the things that happened when we were being persecuted so bad. And then he tells them about the chains falling off. And the doors started going wide open. And the encouragement that comes from that, we survived. Not only did we survive, we survived in a powerful way. Hmm. The sharing of our lives becomes as, a, as central to the gospel. The good news is, is that Christ came and died for us, that we could live a life that's free. 
And we can live a life that's inviting. And we can live a life that's, for, that's in Christ. And there's going to be difficulties along the way. But if we come together as a community, we can do infinitely more than we can do by ourselves. So we look at this, we look at the text in the Reformation and this thread that gets pulled through all of it, this idea of we can work out our own salvation, but it's best if we try to do it in community, sharing our lives, sharing the good news, sharing all that we have, sharing our bread. There's a, uh, a book that I'm going to have the leadership of the church read. It's called Worship Ways. And it talks about people in society today the fact that we're not the church of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. That people are still searching for that connection with God because even though that we can find community in lots of different ways, we don't have to gather at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning to get together with each other, do we? We were together last night. There was a big group of us together at, at a PEO uh, dinner. And we found ourselves sitting together, sharing again. So what I'm saying is 10 o'clock on Sunday morning may not be the time that people want to experience God. It's the time we do. So we've got to find a way that, that even though that, that may not be for everybody, the one common thread for everybody is that of all the things that, that research has told us is there seems to be an innate, an innate compulsion, an innate compelling reason to find God. Now, most of them, most people today, their spirituality is all over the place. And they may not find it here with our congregation at 10 o'clock because we gather as a body of believers and we're a whole lot like ourselves. We look around us and we seem a pretty homogenous group. Not just, not just, uh, uh, ethnically and not just uh, racially, but and not just, but we, we tend to be um, of the same demographic. When somebody says, "What's the demographic of the church?" We fit it here, but then so do most of the churches in this community. But what if we lived in a diverse community, a, a, a greater diverse community? It's the same thing. What we find, what we find is that, that, that there's in this innate ability, innate sense of wanting to find a connection with God, we find that people gather where their existential anxiety is a word that they use, is met. And by that he means loneliness. People gather where there are people that can identify with my loneliness, with my brokenness, with my outcastness, with my feeling that I've been set to the side, with my displacement, with my injury, with my, the death that I'm facing. Once they can find somebody that can come alongside them in that anxiety, that's the place they're going to worship. That's the, the church they want to go to. And it's not people that want to commiserate with each other. It's people who want to share their lives together, their brokenness, like Paul. With the church at Thess in uh, Thessalonica, we shared our very lives with you. We shared everything about ourselves with you. And for that reason, you welcomed us. If we could find a way that when people come to us and we welcome and greet them, to find out through conversations and through sharing our lives, our story, our novel with them at a particular time, then what we'll find is that their people are going to be just like us. <clears throat> So when we start building this kingdom, when we start opening the doors to this kingdom, that all of a sudden now we're not as quite as homogenous group. And what we'll find that when we sit here, we think that we're a homogenous group and we're not because there's broken lives here. There's death being dealt with right here. There's displacement being dealt with right here. But some of these people that are dealing with these issues are feeling mighty lonely right now because they're not having anybody to share their story with or to come alongside them. And the church does its best work when it can do that. The Reformation is, I'd like for you to look at it as a way to reformation, not reformation. Reformation happened 500 years ago. We're, not, we, we, we're well past that. But reformation happens every day. And God is the great reformer. 
God calls us to change ourselves. God's very nature is to continue to create and create us and to reform us. Doesn't John's gospel start off in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh? Now that's reformation. That's reformation. As we come together today and we think about this, this idea of, of where we're to be and what we're supposed to be doing, we've got to pull this thread along and know that, that we are called to share our stories with others and then this is our witness. This is the part of the, 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 the whole scenario that we're, we are part of. That yes, we can share our presence and prayers and all the things that we can share, but if we, we have to share our witness, which means we share our story. We have to share this good news by sharing our life. The good news becomes alive then. It's not that you need to believe in Christ because Christ died for us on the cross. But how about if we say that you need to believe in Christ because let me tell you what God did for me through Christ. Through that pain and suffering you went through that I was able to do the same thing. I got this affliction, I got that affliction, but Christ raised me up through the loss of a job, through the loss of a spouse, through the loss, of, through all my brokenness. His brokenness sustained me. And let me show you how that, that happened. Now that's a different witness. We don't need to thump Bibles and beat people over the head with it. We need to share our lives. And in sharing our lives, we share the good news. We take what we have. We take all that we have. But we don't have to add to it. We don't have to keep putting stuff onto it. We just rearrange it. It's like this word becoming flush. We start with something basic that's already there. And we just kind of move it around. It becomes so real. And it's constantly changing. It makes us wonder what's possible. It means that our stories just continues to be told and told in various ways. Never still, always moving, always shaping. And just when we think that we have an answer to what our story is, where it's going, what it means, then all of a sudden something happens in our life. It causes us to be reshaped a little bit, reformed. Reformation takes place again. Knowing that as long as we breathe, God's still working on us. Shaping us. Calling us. Speaking to us. Never ends. Design us a little bit. Cause us to think about things differently. Use what the power of you, the gifts that we have in our lives to be a witness, to share with others. Possibilities are in us. shade above your head. Bringing people into your lives. Finding that brokenness and then finding somebody to share it with. Finding that displacement that we feel. Finding a way to fill that void. <laughs> 